Hello and welcome to Schema Stories. My name is Martha Van Burkle and I'm the co-founder of Schema App. And we bring the Schema Stories to bring real people who work with schema.org in real life uh, to share sort of how um, it all fits in and, and sort of the value and, and where they see it going. And today I'm honored to be joined by distinguished thought leader in Semantic Web, Richard Wallace. Welcome, Richard. Hi, Martha. How are you? Excellent. Now, I'd like you to introduce yourself. So maybe tell us a bit about yourself and your history with Semantic Search. Okay. Um, yeah, this could take a long time if I go too far back. So let me just say I've been in computing longer than I care to admit. But uh, in, in, in later years, I've been involved with um, semantic web technologies, linked data technologies in all sorts of sectors with a bit of a focus on cultural heritage and libraries. I've worked for library system companies and, 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 and things like that. More recently, I've become an independent consultant, advisor, trainer, anything else you'd like me to do uh, except make the tea. I'm lousy at making tea. Um, for um, anything to do with structured data on the web, semantic web, etc. Uh, I work for various organizations looking to find out about or get trained upon or get some advice about applying um, semantic web techniques specifically around schema.org into their organizations. I also work with, notice the word with, not for, Google in their um, um, application of, of delivering schema.org to the world. Uh, as some may know, schema.org is uh, jointly sponsored by Google, Bing, Yahoo, and Yandex, the Russian search engine. Uh, and part of Google's role is they provide the, the webmaster for the, for the site or the vocabulary master, a guy called Dan Brickley. And I work with Dan in, in helping the delivery of the vocabulary. I actually get involved in some of the Python code that runs the site uh, and, and the things that make it run faster and the things that make it run slower, but you don't do many of those with a bit of luck. Extending the vocabulary, advising people, kind of outreach towards people wanting to get involved using the vocabulary or even extending it and adding to it. So quite a, quite a varied role. But this this is all come from a, a short history of uh, schema.org uh, and its use in what you term as uh, semantic search. Uh, maybe we'll explore this a little bit later on. It may be based on semantic principles, but most of it is nothing to do with search, even though the search engines make a great deal of use of it. Thank you. And uh, pretty impressive, Richard, in, in sort of the history and sort of the evolution. Um, you you recently sort of released a blog about some some of your recent work around the schema.org vocabulary specifically. Can you talk about sort of your passion around working on the vocabulary and, and your latest work? Well, I mean, this, this stems from being a, a practical user of structured data on the web. Uh, having come through the, the, the birth of the semantic web and linked data as it arrived, in my work when I was working for library companies, one of the major frustrations was we were experts in structured data and we published data in our vocabularies that nobody else on the web understood. And you, you could see that in any industry you like. So when schema.org arrived on the scene, it was obvious that it was going to become, if it took off, which it has, uh, a de facto vocabulary for all sectors across the web which meant you could understand data published by people in the sector next door and share your resources in, in such a way. So that, that, that kind of passion um, drove me to look at um, schema.org from a bibliographic point of view and seeing some of its limitations. And rather than sitting there and moaning about limitations, I, I set up a W3C community group with the wonderful name of Schema Bib Extend drew together, getting on for 100 people across, across the world, mostly in the bibliographic domain, but also in publishing and, and other areas. And, and we put together proposals to the schema.org community for extending the vocabulary uh, in a bibliographic direction. And over a period of about two years, we added a great deal. So there's not much you can't say now about things in the, in, in the bibliographic and publishing world with schema.org. That then moved on to some more more specific bibliographic stuff, which turns into one of the first to 
extensions to schema.org. Schema.org's got a core vocabulary and it's got extensions which tend to be sector specific, although available to everybody. So uh, bib.schema.org, which was released about a year ago now, came out of that group and my efforts. And, and from that, I, having seen the benefits and seeing the potential of this, I've been passionate about spreading the world across uh, the word across the, the web world for, for the benefit of all, because I can see it taking us to some interesting places. Well, let's talk a bit about those interesting places. You just mentioned sort of right now, people mostly think about schema.org and how do I sort of get rich snippets or, or sort of evolve my search results. Um, but you and I know that that's sort of just, you know, a, a small sector of the benefit of what you can do when you start structuring your data on the web. Um, do you want to talk about sort of your thoughts on sort of those additional values or, or where you think the the application or the use of structured data and, and schema.org may go to? Yeah, I mean, I, I think um, we, we notice very slowly how the web's evolving and the web is changing dramatically uh, and has been doing for the last couple of years and it's on a trajectory to change even more. Um, and what the search engines... Uh, we're finding is just by interpreting text off a web page, you could infer uh, a reasonable amount about the thing that you thought the page was about. Uh, but, uh, and they got very clever at this, uh, but I think they've, they've hit the problem of diminishing returns from uh, identifying text on the page. And what they really want to know is, what is the thing that this page is about? Um, and how does that thing relate to other things? So. If it's a widget, how does it relate to the organization that made it or to the organization that's selling it or the delivery terms or the offer to sell it or multiple offers and that kind of stuff? If it's a bank talking about loans, what sort of loans are they talking about? Is it a commercial loan? Is it a mortgage loan? What's the interest rate? All that kind of thing. And it becomes very difficult to infer that from, from text. So building on a lot of previous technologies, embedding structured data within the page specifically with schema.org for no other reason than that's what the search engines are looking for um, you can you can tell them specific detail about the thing or things and very often it's things that are, are, are described on the page and the relationship to other things not necessarily in your domain so when you're talking about uh, the place your local branch is located, you can say that this is the same as this place as defined in Wikipedia, for instance. So then the search engines are starting to build up a, uh, a context uh, set for the whole world and the relationship between them. Um, in scientific terms, that's called a graph. And this is where the term knowledge graph comes from with the search engines. What they're doing is building these massive related entity graphs of what's available on the world. If you're part of that, you can then become part of what the search engines are using this for. Some of it is rich snippets. Uh, what was the rating of this particular project product when it was sold or the TV program when it was viewed? Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, so, so, some, some of it is, is used to help them deliver um, information boxes, answer boxes. So, you know, if you ask how high Mount Everest is, invariably you'll get an answer box with just a picture of the mountain and 8,848 meters. I've got a picture of it on the screen. <laughs> um, um, so where are those attributes coming from? They're coming from the knowledge graph. So they're then using this to evolve the web. The web is changing, as I say. Very often to any of us, if somebody said, how would you describe the web to a Martian from outer space? we'd be describing a standard desktop or laptop computer screen with a web page on it. Things have changed. And let me demonstrate this. I, I, I don't know whether this is going to work. I hate doing live demos, but let's see what happens. Let's just watch let's this try. interaction. Let's try. I'm an so, so hey, Siri. Where can I get some cash? One possibility nearby is Halifax on Bridge Street. Do you want that one? No, I don't. The second is HSBC on Bridge Street, less than two miles to your east. How about that one? Yes. Okay. I can call or get directions. Just tell me what you'd like to do. Walking directions. Getting walking directions to HSBC. 
and we should have oh it wants me to log in oh, i should have logged in first anyway there is a map that there we go there's there's the map that tells me how to walk to that bank um <coughs> now that is a common interaction on the web how many web pages did we see then zero so rich snippets um where we rank in search results yes they're important but they're not the whole story and the information that the search engines etc are using to power conversations like that there's some some uh, entities or things that it's getting from my phone it knows who i am and where i am but entities like cash and what we would call cash machines in the uk or atms in, in the states are entities associated with banks associated with bank branches and locations and it can then start inferring hang on i know where richard is i know where the nearest bank is i can draw a line between the two and draw a map so is this what you meant like in your latest presentation um that i'll also kind of share with this uh interview you talked about sort of the future is global and contextual is, is that sort of what you're talking about sort of how the interactions with whatever it is computers or information needs that context to add value yes i mean you can have the cleverest computer in the world but it is only as good as the information input into it so we hear about uh, cognitive computing computers winning quiz shows and, and 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 that kind of stuff but that computer which was ibm's watson could only win that quiz show if it had the information that could be used for that for for the questions so what we're doing here is we're providing amongst other sources but a major source of information to these knowledge graphs that is setting a global context that the search engines can use for rich snippets in possibly improving their search results even though they tend to be a little bit coy about whether that is actually happening or not and i say i work with google not for google so i don't even know the answer to that question myself um, but it, it's also laying the context for this these semantic discovery algorithms to be run not just by the search engines because this data is open to anybody to 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 build a map of knowledge across the world uh, a map of entities and their relationships and attributes across the world that we can be part of and if if you look back two years ago that conversation i just had with my phone would have been seen as something utterly amazing and more futuristic a right <laughs> yeah, totally. so that's come along and and if you try it today if you tried it two years ago and go it's not very good try it again today uh, both on android and, and, and apple and, and other operating systems it is much better today than it was before and that's because they've got more information to work with and they've improved the speech recognition and that kind of stuff so if you want uh when somebody asks a question later on in their driverless car um take me to the, the nearest gas station that said sells uh um, chocolate where where's the information going to come from to feed that unless you as the owner of the gas station list the products that you sell on your site in a structured way and that's what's going to drive this thing forward so a de facto uh, general purpose vocabulary is an enabler a lot of people say oh this, this we're at the head of a new wave driven by schema.org we're at the head of a new wave driven by about six or seven different technologies and schema.org is just an enabler but if you want to be part of this and by the way gain the benefits of rich snippets and and, and sim similar activities get on board now yeah, so I was yes, going to ask for, for newbies, right? So people who are new to doing structured data in any sort, um, what's the urgency? Like, we're seeing this big change. Do you see any other major urgency? Um, it's about as urgent as SEO is. If you want to be part of the world uh, and stand a chance for the search engines identifying that your product or your organization or your service maybe just the answer to a question one of their users is using you have to tell them that they're, they're not telepathic i know some people think they are but they're not telepathic uh, they can only work on the data that's given to them now uh what you may find um with something like schema.org is you if you provide more accurate information to the search engines they may be able to answer the question with your resource quicker than it would have traditionally sent them to one of your web pages. 
and and theoretically and this is where the seo community have a little bit of a worry about this theoretically you could end up with less traffic to your site mm -hmm. but you could end up with more accurate traffic so another example uh, if a user is looking for the customer service department of your organization traditionally you type in customer service widgets incorporated and you'd end up on widgets incorporated homepage and you've got to click down and, and find the phone number today if you're providing structured information the answer to that question will be presented on the search engines page probably if it's on a portable device with the ring me now click on it so you get a satisfied customer that never touched your website um, it's amazing so, right and, so, and, and I used to be really like bold and say, you know, will the intent of a, of websites go away to where information will only appear in search, and there'll be some other way to present information about your company, um, but that the website itself will become um, like a historical well, thing. Well, it still has a purpose because if it's a description of a product or the order me page or something like that, uh, the user has to have somewhere to land. The home page starts to become less relevant. And the whole site, its major customer well may well be the search engines providing information to them so they can direct resources to you. On, on that particular example with the phone number, people say, how do I analyze the usage of that? Uh, I did hear of an organization that asked themselves exactly that question, and they have a special phone number, and it's only put in the structured data. So calls to that phone number, they know there's only... Uh, only come from the search engine. So there are ways around this and there are ways to use the structured data in your web page for better analytics. Bit of a deep topic, not going to go into it now or we'll be here till it's time to do Yeah, something. we're we're quite passionate about the semantic analytics and it's something that uh, we're working hard in our in our suite of tools to to enable. But maybe we'll have a follow on conversation about um, that as sort of one of the I'll say sort of different from search, but but big benefits of sort of structuring your data for deep understanding of what your traffic's about right which is yeah. which is exciting so we're almost out of time so one thing i know that you've worked on is sort of the um, extensions and sort of having an external extension so people are sort of you know not the the experts who are deep into the vocabulary and, and are like you sort of maybe in the bibliographic side where there isn't appropriate vocabulary what do you recommend to them okay the, the, there's a spectrum there's core schema.org in its core vocabulary then there are what, what are termed hosted extensions. So there are extensions that have been accepted by the schema.org community, and they're as good as part of their vocabulary. And in fact, uh, the URL or URI you embed in your data is still schema.org slash, it's not bib.schema.org. That, that it's more of a navigational exercise, so people can find d definitions on the website. If you have uh, even more detail that you would want to expose about your resources, that are too industry specific for a general purpose vocabulary like schema.org you can build your own external extension which builds on top of schema.org so it assumes schema.org's there and then you extend those terms if you then embed that in your website um, the systems as a minimum will be able to understand the schema.org data that you've got in there and specialists very often people cooperating in the same marketplace or in the same sector cultural heritage is great for this will also understand what you're describing in an industry specific vocabulary that's built on top of schema.org or relates to schema.org with some relationships between the vocabularies it can get a bit technical you have to be passionate about what you're doing in your sector uh, and like I, I've done some working in the banking sector to help improve the scheme of vocabulary for describing bank accounts and loans and things like that. Uh, and they have um, so much detailed vocabulary. There's no way you could embed that um, in schema.org and still keep the general population understanding what the heck's going on. And, and, and they're looking at building an extension outside of that, as well as enhancing the inside vocabulary. And one of the things I would encourage people to do, if you find that the vocabulary is limited in your area, I'd love to be able to describe this, but can't. Get on board with the group. Uh, anybody can make a suggestion you don't have to be a search engine company you don't have to be a database expert you can just be a user saying i'm trying to mark up my left-handed screw widget and i can't find a property for direction of screw uh, can i suggest one anybody can do that it's a living vocabulary 
the ideal is to release a new release of it every one to two months it probably turns out to be every two to three months at, 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 at the current current rate so it's constantly evolving and changing and building and take part in the conversation excellent and and, and maybe sort of the the last piece we'll have is when i first sort of introduce you I, I sort of said you know can you introduce how you're related to semantic search and you said you uh you might have a some thoughts on on my term semantic search do you want to kind of give us a rant Richard? yeah well well i mean for the first 20 years of its life the the web taught us that the only way to find something is to search as human beings we search and then we tend to discover relationships how often for the people that still go into libraries have you gone into a library gone to exactly the shelf where your book that you want is and you come away with a different book because you search to the general area and then you make related decisions on what you want schema.org and structured data is very closely associated with things and their relationships so if you look at say the google page 10 results which are your search results and then the knowledge panel on the right hand side for the person or the organization or the topic you're looking for if you start clicking around in there you're not searching you're as as the semantic web people would put it you're navigating the graph of knowledge about the resources on the web and that's where the real value is and that's what's happening behind the scenes the intelligent agents the cognitive computing algorithms that are driving things like Siri and navigating those relationships as well as looking at text on pages as well so it's kind of delivering the other side of the discovery coin that's been missing for the last 20 years in in, in the web so when somebody says semantic search uh, I kind of sigh gently uh, and, and say well, it's far more than that but I can understand why such a marketing term has, has evolved I remember trying to explain what Web 2.0 was a few years ago yeah. and with, with, with equal discomfort, but people generally, um, you know, congregate around that flag and have an idea of what we're on about. Almost like searching the semantic web it would be more, more accurate. Yeah, or navigating the semantic web and, and not using the word search at all, but never mind. <laughs> I'm, I'm quite happy to be unhappy. I'm, I'm not. I'm not starting a movement to say, please drop the word "search" from semantic search. All good, Richard. Anything else you'd like to add uh, to our listeners Any, about schema.org or your thoughts on the future? Um, one, one of the thing. One of the questions I'm often asked when I'm working with clients, um, like national libraries and people like that, and and other organisations, is, can I just sprinkle schema.org into my website? Or do I have to re-engineer my whole data infrastructure to take account of it? And the answer is actually both. You can gain a lot of benefit from the data that you already have in the front end that's building your web pages to capture that data and, and, and place it in structured form using schema.org in your website. There are benefits around that, many we've d discussed already. Equally, if you have a lot of structured data in your organization, where you've got uh i don't know pick a bank again a bank i've got branches i've got types of accounts i've got types of loan i've got terms and conditions or all that kind of thing which are entities in the environment it is well worth whilst you're evolving your internal infrastructure to identify those entities so that when they do surface through the website you've got a nice self-contained structured definition of that thing which you can then relate to other things that you're de describing on the website. So you can relate a loan uh, advisor for mortgage loans in a particular branch. You can bring those things together much easier if, if you've got the infrastructure to do it. But you don't have to go the whole hog the whole way. You can, you can equally use things at the surface, and then when you're happy with them, look at the way it impacts your structure. And it does affect your thinking. When you start describing the entities on your web page, it kind of gets you to think about your internal structures as well and identify the benefits of maybe using a bit of structure internally as well. Excellent. One of the conversations uh, my co-founder Mark and I have been having is around open data and how sort of as they start thinking about structuring open data with schema.org or other um, vocabularies, the power that that will have taking open data to the next level. Well, if, if you're sharing schema.org 
data in your web page, you're providing open data to the world. Open data has been proven as a success. I mean, I presume people might have seen this diagram, the, the open data cloud diagram, based on linked data techniques started in 2006. That picture was based in 2014. It was open data, it used linked data principles. But the key difference between that and today is A, you had to produce a special server endpoint to deliver that data, and B, everybody was using a different vocabulary. Even libraries on there are using different flavors of, of the similar vocabularies. So nobody could really understand each other at a deep level. They could at a high level. Layer schema.org on top of that, and all of a sudden, you've got structured open data uh, across the web. And it doesn't mean all your data needs to be uh, open. You, you go into a commercial organization and say, you need to share some open data on your website. And they go, oh, we've got trade secrets. We can't open up everything. What about our customers? You know, you have to get beyond that and say, the elements you want to make open, you, uh, you expose. And I try to stand them on their head by saying, tell me what doesn't need to be shared. It's a much easier question to, to answer, and you end up with a be much better solution. So open data, we're, re we're already on the way. Anybody could pass my website or uh, a library's website that I work with and, and capture the schema.org data openly off their sites. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Richard. We're well out of time. <laughs> thank you for generously sharing your thoughts uh, on where the future is. And um, for people who want to follow up with Richard, you can find him on his blog. Um, and he's always blogging about different uh, elements that he's involved with as well as changes. And, and that blog is dataliberate.com. Thank you, Richard. And thank you for joining us for Schema Stories. Thank you for inviting me, Martin. Martha, I enjoyed it, Martin. Cheers. <laughs>